Well, welcome all. Uh, this is, uh, we're, we're here of course to launch a new edition of Art Oaken's book, but also to celebrate Art himself. Uh, and I'm especially pleased that there's so many people here that from out of town, members of Art's family, and people who have known him a very, very long time. Uh, I know some of you, not sure where you're hiding on me, but I, I do know Lewis and Matt and Steve, and, uh, and Anita Summers is here with us. And I think she's probably known Art longer than anybody else. Uh, because I remember Art <coughs> talking about how when, when he and Bob started out as assistant professors, uh, you were good friends. And I remember the first time I met Larry Summers was when we had him writing a paper for the Brookings Papers. And uh, I said, you see that guy over there? It makes me feel old. I remember bouncing him on my knee. And that was from those days. So Anita, it's great to have you here. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, Janet Yellen is here, and I'm, I want to welcome her especially. She, she and Art uh, share a relationship to Yale, uh, but they also uh, been connected loosely in many other ways. We tried to... We, Janet and I were just talking before this that Art and I tried to hire Janet to come help us with the Brookings papers, but she had a position at Harvard and wouldn't, couldn't be pried loose. Uh, so that never quite happened. However, uh, Art had a great way with dealing with the press and a great way with words and communicating. So there was a time when uh, I guess I guess uh, Arthur Burns' term as chairman was just ending, and Jimmy Carter had become president. That would date this, I think. And the Washington Post, there were rumors running around that Arthur Oaken might, might uh, replace Arthur Burns at the Fed. And I gotta read this just because it reflects how well Art communicated through the press. Quote, just because my first name is Arthur, I smoke a pipe, graduated from Columbia, and from New Jersey, and I'm Jewish, some members of the press are convinced that I would be the next chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. <laughs> yeah. now, that, now that never happened. On the, other, on, the, on the other hand, Janet is not called Arthur. Janet, <laughs> Janet, graduated, Janet graduated from Yale, not Columbia. Janet, to my knowledge, never smoked a pipe. <laughs> But Janet did become chairman of the Federal Reserve. And, and the reason I bring all this up is because if Art was with us, he, he would have been so enthusiastic about that and not the least bit surprised. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Now, uh, oh, I also told that, that Charlie Schultz was here. Charlie, it's great to have you here. I know you're hiding somewhere, but uh, it's wonderful that you came. Uh, because because there is a there's a very strong connection here. Uh, when when Nixon won the '68 election, Kermit Gordon was the president of Brookings, and and he had the great wisdom to bring two young guys who had been uh, at the very top of presidential economic advising uh, during the '60s, during the Kennedy and and Johnson years. And those two guys were Art Oaken and Charlie Schultz. And bringing them to Brookings formed a very strong economics department. Those were the two pillars around which the department was built and uh, uh, prospered uh, all, all, of this, all of this time. So uh, that's, that's the connection between Art and Charlie, which I've always thought of in my mind. So Charlie, great to have you here. Uh, Kermit, let's see. I've become a very slow reader, but I'm going to get there. Well, my, my own friendship with Art, I mentioned that, the, that, that, that Kermit formed, brought, brought Art to Brookings. My, my own connection went back a lot longer than that, and I'll just mention it in passing uh, because it's important to me. Uh, when I first got out of graduate school, Art had come into the Kennedy uh, Council of Economic Advisors and was in charge of the macro forecasting and all of all of that stuff, which at the moment at that time was the 
the center of things. And, and I just graduated, got out of graduate school and, and came to CEA as whatever the lowest rung on the ladder could possibly be. But I did get to be friends with Art and he became a mentor to me and then we became great friends. And uh, I, I learned a, a lot from him. And, and when Kermit brought Art uh, to Brookings in 69, uh, they ganged up on me and convinced me to take leave from the University of Minnesota which I did for two years. And then at the start of my time here, Art and I uh, organized the Brookings panel. And once we got into that wonderful activity, I resigned from, uh, I never went back to Minnesota and have been to Brookings uh, ever since. And, and, and Art was always a, a big part of that. Now, uh, I should say that Art was not only a great economist, which he was, a uh, very creative economist, uh, but he also a wonderful human being. Uh, and uh, I think there are many of us who are still here, who, were, who were, were here with Art in the 70s and who therefore still know him. Uh, it reminded, his presence was, he was, he was uh, not only the smartest guy in the room, but the nicest guy in the room too, which is a wonderful combination. Uh, I, I was reminded, I recently had dinner with Bob Solo, and he was reminiscing a bit. I told him I was going to be doing this and introducing uh, Art's work to, to this audience, and, 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 and I remembered, because of seeing Bob, that, that um, when he spoke at, at Paul Samuelson's memorial service several years ago, he, he wrapped up his remarks by saying, I don't believe in an afterlife, but if I did, nothing would be more fun than having lunch with Paul every day. Uh, I could understand that perfectly, because that's the way I think many of us felt about uh, art at Brookings, that having lunch with Art every day was a, was a great thing. And, and, uh, okay, enough of my mushy reminiscences. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm a little slow, but I will get to these things. I just don't want to miss anything really important. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Art, 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 art was always an advocate of activist fiscal policies. Uh, and in the 60s, so going back to that time when he was at the top of things, um, I remember there was a time early in the early when they were trying to get fiscal stimulus because the the, the recovery was was lagging, and uh, the news came over that that the that the government was thinking of uh, starting up nuclear testing again, and Art said, "I hope they don't do that, but if they do, I hope it's very expensive." <laughs> But he could, he could swing both ways. That's when he needed stimulus. Uh, by the end of the 60s, the Vietnam War had um, changed things drastically. The economy was overheating, and they were trying to get a tax increase through. Uh, and here, here comes the last quote. And I, I offer this one mainly because Steve Oaken is, is with us today, OK? So he, now this is the Washington Post quoting Art Oak and complaining about why they can't get the tax increase they want to try to cool down an overheating economy. Quote, I must say that some recent public utterances against the tax increase remind me strongly of my seven-year-old son's argument against taking medicine. All in one breath, and I can just see Steve, all in one breath, he can reel off a multitude of objections. He's perfectly well. He's so sick that nothing can possibly help him. It might indeed cure his sore throat, but would surely give him an even more painful stomach ache. He will take it later in the day if his throat doesn't get better. He would have taken the medicine without a fuss if his mother had given it to him the day before. <laughs> and it isn't fair unless his brothers take it too. <laughs> uh, so that's... That's, uh, well, that's the art that communicated so wonderfully. The press loved him and I think uh, uh, helped him. Now, when, when art published Equality and Efficiency, which is the reason that we're really here, um, it, I, I admit it was a surprise to me, not the book, but when I first read the Godkin lectures on which the book was based, because it was a side of art that, well, I would have predicted that those were concerns of his. I never imagined that he had such a deep and thoughtful uh, an intelligent treatment of, of that important subject to make. So I was always an egalitarian at heart, and in the things he did, um, I think that they were always informed by this. Um, 
Now, at this point, I was going to introduce Larry Summers by saying that I thought many of those same things could be said of Larry. And uh, Larry is not here. He had to uh, attend a, a funeral in California. So, uh, so Ted is going to uh, uh, pinch it for him. Ted Gear. Good morning, everybody. Uh, in case there was any. Uh, confusion. Uh, I'm most definitely not Larry Summers. Uh, and as George said, Larry had to go to a funeral of a friend. Uh, so he has sent in his prepared remarks. I would say people talk about bucket lists, impersonating Larry Summers with his mother in the crowd. <laughs> and I should say welcome to Dr. Summers. That was not on my bucket list. <laughs> I don't think I had the imagination or certainly the chutzpah to put that on the bucket list, but I'll do my best. So with apologies to Larry. And I know he regrets he can't be here. Uh, and I, the giggle from the crowd reminds me I should say hello and welcome to the Oaken family. It's a real pleasure to have all of you here today. Uh, OK. I am told that I first met Art Oaken days after my birth, though I confess to not remembering. I do remember calling him Uncle Art and playing baseball with his sons, my brothers, Art and my father at the playground near the house where I grew up. And I remember as a 14-year-old hearing his Fells lectures on stabilization policy at Penn and finding the idea that scientific analysis could lead to better policies, which would prevent people from being unemployed to be incredibly exciting. Not long after I started pressuring my parents to teach me economics, oops, excuse me, not long after I started pressuring my parents to teach me economics and was lucky to have parents who could do a splendid job of it. I'll talk in just a moment about the great book that we are here to discuss. But first, I want to say something about art was part of the highlight and one of the lowest lights of the early part of my career. The first significant paper I wrote was my paper with Kim Clark on labor market dynamics published in the Brookings Papers in 1979. We were graduate students, and art was a leader of the profession, but he and George Perry put tens of hours into getting our paper right, relevant, and clear. Never before or since have I received a critique of my work that was as penetrating or as constructive. It was an immense gift and one that established standards I've tried to live up to ever since. That was the highlight. The low light came a year or two later, when not too long after Art died, I propounded a somewhat half-baked argument at the MIT Economics Department lunch table. Skepticism was expressed. I persisted. Finally, Paul Samuelson ended the conversation by remarking in words I have never forgotten. Larry, I recently wrote a eulogy for R. Oaken. In it, I observed that I had never heard him say a stupid thing. Well, Larry, it looks like now I will not be able to say that about you. <laughs> Brilliant. I learned something from Paul's put down and even more from Art's example. The stakes in economic policy making are enormous. Economics is not physics. Economic theories do not just describe the world. They can change it. Rigorous modeling, effective polemic, and elegant mathematics can be very dangerous when they are not informed by wisdom and good sense and a willingness to learn from experience. Art's capacity for well-rounded wisdom regarding the most important issues of the day was nowhere better illustrated than in Equality and Efficiency, The Big Trade-Off, the book whose 40th anniversary we celebrate today. I still remember the excitement with which I read it as a first-year graduate student. It was the antithesis of the first-year economic theory sequence in which I was mired, a thoughtful, engaging, rigorously logical analysis of real issues that were crucial to the well-being of the American people. Rereading re the book in preparation for writing a new forward for it, I was struck at one level by how well it reads today. If a very bright student or policymaker or expert in another field was seeking an understanding of how economists think about the role of markets and issues of fairness, I would even today recommend Oaken's book. While recognizing the many virtues of markets, he anticipates the arguments of subsequent critics like my Harvard colleague Michael Sandel when he discusses why it would be wrong to allow citizens to buy their way out of jury, jury duty or sell themselves into bondage. Oaken is acute on the philosophical questions. 
I suspect he would have rejected the terms of the debate slated to follow these remarks. We'll see. He would have said, of course, there are opportunities starting from where America is today to take measures like increasing access to higher education, which would promote both efficiency and equity. And he would have had more, many more examples that likely would have included closing tax shelters, attacking monopolies, and fostering international economic cooperation. At the same time, he would have recognized that there were likely limits on the amount of inequality reduction that could be achieved with policies that also accelerated growth. And so he would have recognized that as usual in economics, there are trade-offs. The more of one objective you achieve, the less you are likely to achieve of some other objective. Substantial increases in redistribution are likely to come at some debatable cost in terms of economic efficiency. So his balanced advice would have been to first implement policies that increase growth while increasing equality, and then consider those measures that involve trading off efficiency and equality. At another level, rereading Oaken's book reminds one of how much the economy has changed since the 1970s or even since the 1990s, and as a consequence, how much a sensible progressive policy agenda today is different than the one that was appropriate in the 1970s or 90s. In my foreword to the reprinting of Equality and Efficiency, I describe the major changes in the economy and speculate about what Art would be recommending if he were with us today. Rather than reprising that discussion here, let me conclude by noting how in areas relating to equity and efficiency, my thinking has changed in response to a changing economy over the last 40 years. This is not, I believe, because my values have changed, but is rather because of changes in the economy and our understanding of it. When Oaken wrote, and for some years afterwards, economists believe that the distribution of income as reflected either in the profit share or the share of income going to different quintiles of the population was relatively constant. It followed that the dominant determinant of the growth rate of middle income families was the overall economic growth rate, or essentially equivalently, that average wages would track productivity growth. This led to great emphasis on measures that could be expected to raise productivity or productivity growth. For many years now, it has been the case that the income distribution has been growing much more unequal. In particular, the share of income going to the top 1% has risen rapidly from about 8% of income in the late 1970s to above 20% today. And the share of capital income and total income continues to rise. Updating a calculation performed a few years ago by Jason Furman and me, I recently calculated that if the income distribution were the same as it was in 1979, about $1 trillion more would be going to the bottom 80% of the population, increasing their income by almost 25%, and then about $1 trillion less would be going to the top 1%, reducing their incomes about in half. In this context, unlike the one in which Oaken wrote, it is clear that influencing the distribution of income and its trend has the potential to have a major impact on the well-being of the middle class. How? With inequality higher and progressivity lower, the case for progressive reform is strong. Certainly because of what has happened in the economy, I would, in thinking about tax policy, put much more emphasis on distributional issues relative to efficiency issues than I would have during much of my career. Similarly, I believe that concern with issues relating to the cost of capital and the adverse effects of taxes in increasing it has been very legitimate at points in the past. At present, when zero interest rates make capital costs as low as they have ever been, but corporate profits are at record levels, there needs to be much less concern with capital costs and more concern with the distributional aspects of capital taxation. The same basic idea that rising inequality tips the balance between fairness and efficiency applies in other areas of policy as well. So also does the emergence of deflation or low inflation as a threat to the American economy. Oaken recognizes the minimum wage can be dangerously high and excessively strong unions can do damage if jobs are taken away and inflation is promoted. These risks are remote today. Indeed, more income for workers would likely contribute to more spending, which would in turn increase employment. When the minimum wage is actually lower in real terms than it was when Oaken wrote, and when only 6% of private sector workers are covered by unions, I would judge that the benefit-cost ratio seems tilted towards minimum wage increases and towards relaxation of the rules regarding the rights of private sector workers to bargain with management. Another areas where conditions have changed over the years is with respect to policy directed at the financial sector and corporate governance. The financial sector has shown itself to be less of a source of diversification and stability and more of a source of instability 
than most judged a generation ago. At the same time, compensation levels in the sector and in firms engaged with the sector has gone up rapidly. The simultaneous emergence of high profits and low interest rates raises the question of whether monopoly power is on the increase. So the question of regulatory actions looms much larger than it has for many years. I could go on and talk about the equity benefits of, high, of a high pressure economy, mandated paid leave for those with family responsibilities and a range of issues. I will though have made my point if I have whetted your curiosity with respect to Art Oaken's most influential book and made the case that an economic policy with regard to issues of equity, Abraham Lincoln had it right when he said, quote, as our case is new, so we think anew and act anew. Thank you. Good morning, I'm David Wessel. I'm director of the Hutchin Center on <coughs> Fiscal and Monetary Policy here at Brookings. And it's a pleasure to sort of pick up where Art Alkin left off this morning uh, the striking thing to me as I reread this book, uh, the, the new issue of it, uh, is, uh, well, there are two striking things. One is it's incredibly lucid. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the standard in academic economics these days. Uh, and there's not one Greek letter in it, which I take as a, a huge plus. Um, but the other thing, and, and Greg Mankiw and I were talking about this earlier, is that it's striking that a book that is written 40 years ago if you adjust for the, the numbers are all off because of inflation, uh, can be so relevant today. But let me just read you part of the opening passage, which will then uh, lead to our panel discussion. Oaken writes that contrasts among American families in living standards and in material wealth reflect a system of rewards and penalties that is intended to encourage effort and channel it into socially productive activity. To the extent the system succeeds, it generates an efficient economy. But that pursuit of efficiency necessarily creates inequalities. And hence, society faces a trade-off between equality and efficiency. Trade-offs, he writes, are the central study of the economist. You can't have your cake and eat it too is a good candidate for the fundamental theorem of economic analysis. We can't have our cake of market efficiency and share it equally. Uh, so joining me up here to talk about this today are um, Heather Boucher, who's Executive Director and Chief Economist at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth and a Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. Uh, Melissa Kearney, who's Director of the Hamilton Project, Senior Fellow here at Brookings, a Professor of Economics at the University of Maryland. And Melissa informs me that they have both had media training, which went to the color of dress you're supposed to wear. <laughs> they, had the same, they had the same training. Uh, uh, Greg Mankiw is the Robert M. Barron Professor of Economics at Harvard, a former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, and co-chairman of the Hutchins Center Advisory Council. And Justin Wolfers, who's on leave from the University of Michigan, is a non-resident senior fellow here and a resident senior fellow across the street at the Peterson Institute uh, for International Economics. So I thought I might start with uh, that opening quote from Art Oaken's book. It seems to me there are three possibilities. One is, there is the trade-off that Art Oaken described, and the debate is how much we should favor equality and how much we should favor inefficiency. The second possibility, there's a trade-off, but our current policies are so inefficient that we can have both more inequality and more efficiency. And the third is that Art Oaken is basically wrong, that there isn't as much of a trade-off as he suggested, Indeed, um, Paul Krugman recently wrote, citing some new research at the IMF, that, quote, taking action to reduce the extreme inequality of 21st century America would probably increase, not reduce, the rate of economic growth. So, Greg, can I ask you to start? To what extent is there still a trade-off, or where is it, or how do you think about this? I, I, the way I think about it is there's a trade-off, and some policies move us along the trade-off, but other policies shift the trade-off. So like sort of inflation unemployment trade-off. Sometimes you move along and sometimes you shift it. So let me sort of give you an example of each. I think when he was thinking, when Oken was thinking about the trade-off, he was basically thinking about tax and transfer policy. You know, we tax the rich and we give money to the poor. And I think there, there really is a trade-off because when you do that, you're raising marginal tax rates for both the rich and the poor. The rich because they're paying the taxes and the poor because they're probably facing effective tax rates because the benefit they're getting is gonna phase out as their income goes up. So I think that's sort of the classic case. And that's the, when he was talking about the leaky bucket, which I see is now on the cover of this new book, right. 
Uh, I think that's what he meant. He was thinking of a tax and transfer policy. And then the question is how leaky is the bucket or, so or not? Just, just define for people who don't know what the leaky bucket is. Oh, was. sure. <clears throat> the, the leaky bucket was a metaphor saying that when you take money from the rich and give it to the poor, it's like you're taking money from uh, taking water from one part of a desert island to, to another part. But as you move water around, it, it, you only have a leaky bucket. And so when you move, move this money from the rich to the poor, some of the money's going to leak out because of reduced incentives, reduced efficiency costs. And he's saying, how much of a leak are you willing to put up with? And he sort of says, 10 or 20 percent I'm willing to put up with, not 90 percent. You know, and he contrasts himself to Rawls, who would be willing to put up with any amount to increase the people at, at the bottom. So I think that's an example of, of the trade-off. But I do think there are policies, and I think Oaken believed too, there are policies that shift the whole trade-off out. I mean, Oaken mentions schooling. To the extent we can increase schooling for underprivileged people, for sure that's going to mean more efficiency and more equality. Um, I think there's other policies that would do that too. For, let me give you a couple examples. Um, I think if we let more skilled immigrants into this country, it's going to change the mix of skilled and unskilled workers. That's going to tend to increase both efficiency and equality. And let me give you one that I think is more controversial, and I bet not everybody will agree with me. There's a big debate about the minimum wage. Some economists like the minimum wage, some economists don't like the minimum wage. But I think most economists think the EITC is better than the minimum wage. So let me suggest we abolish the minimum wage, expand the EITC, and I think that's a policy that would increase equality and efficiency, although I'm, guess, I'm guessing no, that everybody's going to talk about that for an hour. No, no, yeah, no, 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 but I think there are things we can do in terms of helping people at the bottom that don't, aren't necessarily involving the, the trade-off. Heather? Um, well, I, I don't agree with the last point. Um, I'll, just, I'll just throw that out there. Um, so, so I wanted to make a, a couple things. I mean, first, um, you know, they, we've sort of set this up as a, as a debate, which I, I will sort of admit, on at least on for me, is a little bit tough when I know that there's family members in the audience. So I want to start off by saying the book was really fantastic. <laughs> and, and, but I don't agree with it. Yeah, him. and I'm sure he was a lovely person. Um, and it was very lucid and well written. I, it um, it really was a delight to read. But um, I mean, I want to. I mean, I think that this the the point about the minimum wage and EITC notwithstanding, you know, for me, rereading this um, over the past couple of weeks really kind of hammered home the ways that I think that this is really more of a historical document than something that we should be looking to as a guide for policymaking today. Um, I think a lot of uh, the comments that Larry Summers made were made in uh, you when you when you tear away the first part and look at the actual recommendations he made at the in the second half of his remarks are are consistent with this. Um, you know, I think both our empirical starting point in terms of the economics today, but also in terms of the political situation, the political economy is so different from the moment in which Oaken was writing about in 1975 um, that I found as I was rereading it there were these just these shocking, very jarring phrases um, that were hard to, to reconcile with our own political reality. Um, so for example, at some point in the book, he says something, and I, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but that, of course, everyone agrees that you know those people who um, aren't healthy should have access to health insurance you know, if, if folks need it. And of course, this was the same day that I was reading in Political that you know uh, many uh, Republicans are promoting work requirements for Medicaid. So this is certainly not an agreed upon starting place here in today's America, which I think is important as a starting place because so many of his, his analysis and his, and his conclusions all stem from this, this shared vision of what's going on in the economy and um, the political economy that I just don't think is relevant. We have to start from that. Um, second, his, um, where he ends, both the book and then the afterword that, that, that is in this lovely publication, uh, this republication that Brookings is doing, um, he has this plea where he steers social science researchers towards a research agenda that is focused on measuring the effects of the trade-off. And um, as an economist and as a social scientist, I don't think that that's the right um, research agenda. And I also um, have found that research agenda very frustrating over the past few decades because I think it steered us away from some of the really big questions. So um, it con contrast that phrasing with reading the introduction to Thomas Piketty's book, where he exp expresses this real frustration with the economics profession for focusing on narrow questions and not looking at the whole political economy. Um, you know, I think that understanding the pros and cons and the trade-offs is very important, but that is not the primary role, I think, of those of us who are advising policymakers. We need to think bigger, and I think that it is that kind of thinking, dare I say, that's, that allowed us to miss the real importance of this rising inequality that we've seen in recent decades, which is um, having such a pernicious effect on our economy. And then, so finally, my third point is that there is this whole new body of research that is showing that rising inequality is bad for economic growth. Um, and certainly there's nuances to it, and there's a lot more research to be done, but I think we can't ignore that this framing of the trade-off 
just and especially as that as the um, the shorthand for how we should be thinking about policy just isn't consistent with this new macroeconomic evidence. And I'll stop there. I'm sure we'll get back to those in more detail. Well, this is going to be fun because I disagree entirely. Um, so, but, yeah. I was hoping that would happen. Yeah. So let me start by saying, um, so I went back and read the original because I, I just am in love with this book. And um, I remember where I was sitting as a junior in college when I read this book in Firestone Library. And I had been taking sociology of poverty classes and a lot of contemporary American history classes. I was always very interested in poverty. And when I read this book, it was like, you know, light bulbs went off, and I thought this was tremendously uh, clear and honest about the trade-offs and how we can address poverty in this country and yet still foster economic growth and productivity. So I, I have always been very influenced by this book. Um, it sort of was the book that I think convinced me I wanted to be an economist addressing these problems, and I've actually approached my own research about um, tax and transfer policies in the US in exactly this framework, thinking that this is exactly the framework and set of trade-offs we should be using when we evaluate policies in both the big picture and the small picture. And um, this, I mean, I've, I've been pushing this book on my students for over a decade and, and trained them this way. So, you know, I think this trade-off is perhaps even more important today than ever. And as I reread the book this week, I was struck by just how relevant and how forward-looking it was. Um, your, the, you know, the, the quote you pulled out, David, which is, again, I think, you know, it struck me 20 years ago, it struck me again this weekend. I think it really crystallizes the trade-off in the aggregate. Um, and I think Oaken does a great job saying we need to value efficiency, we need to value equity, and we need to think about where our society should be in the balance. Now, I agree with Heather, I think, in saying that we're off kilter today. Um, but that doesn't make this a useful framework. It makes it a great framework. And it says, have we gone too far in allowing too much inequity such that now we're actually costing ourselves and our nation's productivity? And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, the reason why I think the answer is yes is really because of what's going on at the bottom. So I am less concerned about the wealth concentration at the top, say, than maybe some others, because I'm not sure what the costs of that are, but I am sure that the pervasiveness and persistence and the consequences of poverty and the lack of opportunity and upward mobility and the, the lack of jobs and well-paying jobs for too many folks in our economy is a problem. It violates most of our notions of equity, and it also has tremendous cost to our society. Now, I think if we agree on that, that we should do more, then we have to take very seriously Oaken's point about when we design policies and tax and transfer programs, there's a trade-off implicit in the structure of those programs, and we can't get around this. So it's, you know, it's too flip to say, we need to give more to the poor. OK, but how? There are ways we can do it with more or less efficiency costs. And I think exactly public finance economists and those of us who would advise policymakers need to take that into account when evaluating all programs, large and small. So the minimum wage and EITC are perfect examples. You know, I'll even make the point about the EITC. Everyone loves the EITC because we think this is the program that addresses Oaken's point. We subsidize work. We give people incentives to work. Well, that's true unless you're a married couple and you have two minimum wage workers. All the incentives are for the EITC or for that second worker not to go to work. Why? Because when we transfer money to low-income households, we have to tax it away. And when you tax it away, there are people who face a really high marginal tax rate. So even in the program that we hold up as like, this is our best answer to the equity efficiency trade-off, smart design of that program has to acknowledge trade-off implicit in the design. So I think both in thinking about the aggregate challenges and where we are in the continuum of equity versus efficiency, and thinking about at the micro level how we design our programs using the framework that Oaken set out for us is, is a really productive and important way to go. Hey, Justin, you can't agree with everybody. Uh, I'll, 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 well, I'll be perfectly Brookings and, 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 and split the middle in a wishy-washy way. <laughs> um, this will limit your airtime. <laughs> I'm willing to stipulate that there's an efficiency equity trade-off. And I think that Oaken's focus on it, though, 
is the result of the great confidence of economists of the day 50 years ago that we lived in an economy where we were somewhere close to that frontier. Um, and I think that if you thought about today's politics, you would be less confident. If you looked at the policy development subsequently, you would be less confident. And I also think that um, the scope of economics has changed. And I'm now from a discipline that's far more infused in both, economic, in both sociology and political science. And I think that pushes you to look beyond tax and transfer policy. Tax and transfer policy is the obvious case where there's a sharp trade-off. When you look beyond it, I think far less so. So, you know, I think there's a horse race here between the incentive problems and what we know to be the real consequences of inequality. Um, health problems, mental illness, um, trust, social mobility, um, it, it very different politics that arise when we have greater inequality. So, um, you know, if you turn the question around and said, you know, is the implication of Oaken that the pie needs to be smaller in order for each of us to have more equal slices, I think the answer is certainly not. And there's a huge list of policies, I think, that help us on both inequality and, and growth. Um, the, the most important of which I think is discrimination. The effective emancipation of women over the past 50 years has been one of the most important uh, engines of economic growth and, of course, of, of uh, reducing inequality within, within households and within families. Um, we've seen in some industries a rise in monopoly power. Monopoly power, it's just rents. It's not allocative. It doesn't necessarily help us get uh, more of any stuff. Uh, over the past 30 years, so the, the, much of the American growth miracle was the result of people going to school. Uh, 30 years ago, American men decided to stop going to school. Um, and so we haven't had increases in educational attainment in several decades. American women, I think, have been somewhat more sensible. Um, we've got, uh, you know, if you think about, uh, so, you know, there are huge gains in human capital, which could improve both growth, growth and inequality. Once you start thinking about those sorts of investments, you can't help but thinking about neighborhoods. And you look at pictures of Baltimore, and you look at pictures of Ferguson, and you see neighborhoods where uh, in investments could surely help both growth and inequality. Um, the problem of ma mass incarceration was not on the agenda in, in Oaken's day, but surely is a huge issue in terms of both inequality and, and growth. Um, we've seen the decline of the American union movement. Unions certainly held, held, helped hold inequality down. The more functional among them could also help raise productivity. The less functional, absolutely, uh, I, I'd agree. I, I'd agree, may, maybe not. Um, so, you know, I, you know, as an economist today, I'm far less confident we're anywhere near this frontier where we've got to start worrying about trade-offs. There's a bunch of stuff we can do, which I think will have enormous effects on on reducing well on reducing inequality and could have big effects on growth too. So, Greg, do you agree with the point that we're far from the frontier that we could reduce inequality substantially and not hurt efficiency, productivity, and growth? I gave you several, several examples, right. um, which I thought we could in yeah. increase both. I think those are politically difficult. Right. Um, I think there's also disagreement among economists. My eliminate the minimum wage, expand the EITC is an example where we wouldn't have come right. to an agreement here on, the, on this panel. Um, but I think you have to acknowledge there's a trade-off when you're talking about tax and transfer systems. And I think that was mainly what Oaken was, was, was focus, focused on. But it seems to me that it, it is striking when you read Ogan's book, and he describes, Larry talked about this a little bit, the degree of inequality 40 years ago compared to today. Uh, I mean, just one example, Ogan writes that the uh, richest 1% of American families have about a third of all the wealth, and the bottom half hold about 5% of all the wealth. And if you update that using similar data sets, the richest 1% have over 40% of the wealth, and the bottom half held only 1%. So doesn't that suggest that we're, <coughs> we're, there's a chance that we're farther from the frontier? No? The question is, why is that? Why have we experienced increasing inequality? Um, and I mean, let me, let me um, mirror something that Justin said, which I think a lot of it has to do with education. I, mean, I think that one of the best books about this is not the, the Piketty book, it's actually a book by two of my Harvard colleagues, Claudia Gold and Larry Katz, where they, the title of the book is The Race Between Education and Technology. And their basic story is that Technology tends to be a force driving towards increased inequality because skilled workers use new technologies and unskilled workers are replaced by them. Uh, and education is the force in the other direction that turns unskilled workers into skilled workers. And, we ha and I agree with Justin, we haven't been doing as good a job on the education front uh, as we had in previous generations.
So I, there's two things I want to pick up on that. So often these facts about the top 1% are cited to say we've gone too far. But I want to challenge us to say if we want to keep saying that, why is that a problem? And I just have not seen convincing research to tell me that that 1% is purely a rent grab, that it doesn't reflect increased productivity. I mean, this is a minority view, but we focus so much as if just the fact that the rich have all this money is bad. And I really want to challenge those of, you know, those among us who are saying that to explain exactly why that's bad. Again, I know why it's bad that we have mass incarceration, why educational attainment has stalled. I know why those things are bad. For us to figure out what we need to do about the top 1%, I think we have to figure out what's driving that, how much of that increases uh, economic productivity, the returns to a global market, how much of it, you know, cal it increases rent. And I don't think we know that. The second, um, you know, the, the second point is um, the point about the mass incarceration, I, I think Ogin mentions this. I was struck this time rereading it. He talks about why we don't allow people to buy votes. And he talks about criminal justice system. And there are things that we need to take out of the marketplace. And so while he doesn't talk about mass incarceration in those words, he raises this issue very clearly, which is that if people think that uh, the, the system, the institutions aren't fair, that leads to a lot of frustration. And um, he says, you know, those inequities can produce compound inefficiencies. And I think that's what we're seeing. An, an amazing euphemism, um, but a good one. Um, so, but Melissa, here's the thing. You sort of said, you sort of shift the presumption here, right? You're like, you know, you have to prove to me beyond a reasonable doubt that all this money going to the top 1% is a problem. That's a strange presumption. But let me give you a different frame for it, OK? We should be worried about incentives. We're economists. That's what we're paid to do. Um, so let's think about whose incentives are we worried about? Which groups of people do we think are currently not working as hard as they could or using their talents as much as they should because of the tax system? Do we think it's the top 1% or do we think it's sort of, you know, middle and working class families and secondary earners? Um, if we think it's the latter, and I think the evidence is reasonably strong on that, then what we need to do is rejigger our incentives to move the work incentives to where the workers are rather than at the moment to where the money is. Or where the workers are not. We want more right, of those folks working. Right, where the workers should working. be, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, think, I think that's right. And I think, I mean, why I worry about inequality is because I think the gap between those at the bottom and the middle have become, it's become so wide that there's too many folks at the bottom who don't see a way up, who are shut out of those networks and those institutions. And we see that they're dropping out of school. They're becoming teen moms. They're not doing the things we think they should be doing to invest in themselves. I'm not sure it's irrational. Right? I think they're responding to the environment around them. And that's why we do. I agree on the point that we need to do more to foster inclusion in our economy and our society for folks who are feeling marginalized. Well, so if I could jump in on just a, a couple of things. I mean, one, so the idea that what's happening at the top is not of concern when we're thinking about what's happening at the bottom and the middle. I think that's, I don't think that, I think that the evidence actually goes in the other direction. I would point first to a recent paper by Branko Milanovic and Roy Vanderveed, um, where they've looked at the effect of inequality on growth across states and have found that, and they've disaggregated, so they're, they're basically um, able to show that rising inequality actually reduces incomes for the bottom and boosts them at the top. And so I think, and so that in and of itself, one study doesn't, you know, isn't enough for us to go on, but I think it brings up a whole series of questions about what that money at the top is being used for, what kinds of incentives it's creating in our economy writ large, but also the extent to which those gains at the top have been really at the expense of those at the bottom. When you look at the long-term trends, one of the striking things about 1975, when Oaken um, first wrote this book, is how that really is, is, I mean, it's sometime in there, that magic moment where the world shifted from a world of equality where everyone was growing together to a world where that was no longer the case. Um, so, uh, and, and many of those, you know, as we've seen from 1975 through today, Piketty and Size's data show that 110% or 109% of the gains have gone to the top um, relative to the bottom 90%. So I think we, that, I think that, that, that question, I think it'd be good to spend a little bit more time um, discussing. But then second, 
I think we also need to understand how those gains at the top, at the top affect the opportunities, not just for the bottom, but the way folks at the top are, uh, to use a term that I first learned from Richard Reeves here at Brookings, um, opportunity hoarding, um, and what that's doing to communities around the country, how it's bidding up prices for homes and neighborhoods with good schools, like what advantages are being sort of kept at the top and people are not being allowed to move up, not just from the bottom to the middle, but importantly, and I want to bring this into the conversation, the middle. I think that this trade-off, um, part of my frustration with it is I don't think it's just about the top and the bottom. That's not what's happened to America. What we've seen is this lack of growth in the broad middle, which is where we need to be focused, A, if we care about democracy, but also if we want people at the bottom to actually be able to attain and achieve a safe and decent middle class lifestyle, you have to care about what's going on in that in that place. So if you're seeing this opportunity hoarding at the top, that's affecting what's happening in the in the middle. But finally, and my last point, then I'll let someone else talk, is I do think thinking about the um, the effect on our political process of um, folks at the top just cannot be, I just, I don't think it can be understated. Earlier this uh, last week, we did a, a conference at uh, Yale with a bunch of political scientists. We're always, we spent, you know, a whole day and a half discussing the effects of economic inequality on political outcomes. And there appears to be a lot of evidence that today's high inequality, and especially this pulling away at the very, very top, is having effects on our political debate, our political process. And that all has an effect on the, the lives and living standards of everyday people. So I, I think that we, I, I mean, all three points are really just sort of hammer home that I think that this trade-off, and Oaken many times in the book, is like, we don't need to be focusing at the top. Don't worry about that. We're regulating them. They can't, they can't affect the political process. We need to be focusing on the bottom. I think that's the wrong question, um, and we need to be thinking about the top a lot let me, more. Let me pick up. I'm always reluctant to raise politics with four economists who so then tell me they're not <laughs> experts, but both Justin and Heather have opened the door, so I feel. So I think you've misstated Oaken. I, I think if you read Oaken, he was worried about uh, how money influenced politics, and if you were worried about that 40 years ago, you can only worry about it more now. <clears throat> At one point he says, how does capitalism su survive in a democracy? What makes the not so affluent majority so charitable towards the rich minority? The tolerance of the masses for economic equality, inequality is puzzling, at least it is to me. He says, radicals on the left say money buys votes, democracy is a sham, and he I think a caricature says free market fundamentalists say capitalism provides higher standards of living for most families. The not so affluent recognize that and therefore they tolerate it. But I, I do think that, and this is a point that Joe Stiglitz has made, that he, he wrote uh, that inequality isn't so much a matter of capitalism in the 20th century as is of democracy in the 20th century. So to what extent do we worry that the degree of inequality influences the political process so we can't pursue those policies that might, like Greg suggests, uh, both increase efficiency and equity. I, I'm more skeptical <coughs> about the role of money in politics. I, I point out we have the, probably the most liberal president in uh, half a century. Probably in six or seven years. In. <laughs> 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 um, Whereas we now we have high levels of inequality, so I'm 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 skeptical that there that there's this direct link from money to, to to politics. And to the extent there is, we should think about the political system. I think that, that most things rich people spend money are not politics. Uh, uh, secondly, I should note that you know, why are we so concerned about inequality right now? The period of time actually with the biggest increases in inequality was between 1980 and 2000. It's been it's been high, but sta more stable since then. But we're worried about inequality now. Why is that? Well, I think it's because the economy has generally been pretty crappy right. for the past few years. So I think we worry more about inequality when things are bad than when things are going well. And I think Oaken's right that when things are going well for the typical person, we don't really worry about the fact that Mark Zuckerberg. So is there a relationship is doing, is doing between well. stagnant middle wages and the amount of inequality we've had? So, so I think this, you know, the, the question about are Oaken pointing out he's puzzled by why Americans put up with this? You know, I have to think that the reason is because Americans have believed for many generations, if they work hard, they will get ahead. And so we have this winner takes all society, but we had this view that that opportunity to get ahead was open to most people. I feel like the political tides are shifting in part because the economic reality has shifting, where that winner takes all not everyone has the same opportunity or even close to the same opportunity to get ahead. And, um, you know, 
we see in the past 30 years the divergence of childhood circumstances for kids born to college-educated parents versus low-educated parents. Those kids start out with so much disadvantage relative to their higher-educated, higher-income peer, you know, peers in such families that that dream that everyone can get ahead, that aspiration that came from this winner-takes-all economy that we were willing to put up with, I think the appetite and allowance for that is waning. So I think, I think that's a really good point. And there's one place where, I'll get to you in a minute, Justin, where what Oaken said struck me as jarring with the lens of 40 years. He says, obviously, uh, no one knows how much improving a quality of opportunity, he refers to discrimination and income-based loans for college, uh, would enhance either a quality of income or efficiency of the economy. But then he says, uh, the right is convinced that opportunities are basically equal and no heroic efforts at reform are needed. The left argues no amount of equalization of education or hiring practices will dent the amount of inequality. All I would claim, Oaken writes, is that such efforts deserve a real try. It seems to me that one of the most striking changes in the political debate over the last few years is that the Republicans and some people on the right have stopped arguing that there's not a problem and that the, one of the few things that Republicans and Democrats agree on now is that we're a bit distressed that there's not more mobility. <clears throat> we know that there's probably no less mobility in a statistical sense than there was, but the inequality has risen. So you can see conversations, Hillary Clinton, Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, uh, Paul Ryan, all struggling to figure out some recipe for improving social mobility. So that's an argument that has changed, I think, in Oaken's day. And Justin, you wrote just today about Raj Chetty's latest work on this. I, I, the, <laughs> you can respond to either what I said or what <laughs> Melissa said. No, I, I, both. I, I, I like your quoting Republicans and their concern about a mobility agenda at the same time that they uh, want to completely get rid of the estate tax for families above $10 million. Um, it strikes me that you're taking speech a little bit too literally there. Um, and if we took bills that were being proposed instead, I'm not sure we'd see such a, a bipartisan commitment to a mobility agenda. Um, so the comment, I, I want to come back to the earlier quote from Art, uh, which I thought was beautiful and in retrospect maybe looks stunningly naive. You said, you know, he asked, how is it capitalism can survive democracy? Why aren't the workers revolting and just pounding the rich into the ground? Um, and 50 years later, that doesn't seem to be the important question. Right. Um, instead, it seems the, the more important question is how is it democracy survives capitalism? And as we're on the cusp of the beginning of the Republican nomination and um, the Adelson primary, soon to be followed by the Koch primary, um, it seems that this is like a much more important question today than it, than it has been in the past. Look, Ogan even says people don't mind um, you know, inequality and in income distribution when it's associated with effort. And I think the concern among a broad swath of the population and folks on the right and the left is that increasingly people exerting a lot of effort are still not making a living wage. And that's where I expect the political appetite for more a, a stronger safety net will take hold when it's like, look at these, look at these individuals and these families. They're working hard. They're getting some college, and they still can't afford the rising costs of housing and healthcare and education. So, you know, th that's about the frontier again. Can I can I just respond to his comment about the Republicans and the estate tax? I can't, I can't let it go. <laughs> the when the Republicans talk about mobility, they talk about trying to help people at the bottom go up. They don't view that as synonymous with t getting people at the top come down. And the, 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 the estate tax issue, I think, is really focused on the, on the people at the very top. And, and, and you know, if you, if you prohibited estates over $10 million, 100% of the tax, the person at the bottom, so who's living in inner city Baltimore, is like, oh, suddenly you have a better life because Mark Zuckerberg can't leave his money to his kids. You make sure those at the top can't fall. I, I don't <coughs> see how you create any mobility. There is no mobility. Well, no, the, the question is when the people, people to bottom, it's not just mobility, we want people to do well. We want people at the bottom to do better. I mean, we, we could have well, mobility by pushing everybody I, down. I, I thought by That's the, mobility, right? I, Everybody's just going down. I, I, That's not the, the same thing as actually getting people up. But, Craig, I thought by the first nine and a half million, my kids were already doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Above that seems a little, a little excessive. Well, that's, that's, that's your judgment call, but that's not, helping, that's not helping the person in inner city Baltimore. I mean, that is not, I mean, saying, saying Mark Zuckerberg, you have, to, you have to spend the money during your lifetime 
don't leave it to your kids is not going to is not going to help anybody. Heather wants to defend well, the estate I mean, tax. A, here. a, it's not it's not don't leave any to your kids, but it's putting it's putting a, a limit on on what is taxed or not taxed. I mean, let's be very clear. It's okay. not don't leave anything. It's not zero fine. or yeah. We're putting a limit on. That's yeah. fine. But but it, those those dollars could be put to very good use helping those kids yeah, in Baltimore. What the estate tax, <laughs> what the state tax says is spend those money in your lifetime. Buy that big yacht. Buy that big mansion. Buy the Ferrari. Because if you money to spend it while you're alive, yes. you know, it doesn't get taxed, right? It's only it's only the stuff you leave to your kids that gets taxed. And so that's the main thing the estate tax does. It changes the relative price of your consumption, your kids' consumption. But don't we want young entrepreneurs to all, well, at any rate, we, can, we, could, we could keep debating this till the cows come home. But, um, but it seems like we want that flexibility at the top. And it also seems so un-American to me to have this group of people that we want to just stay up there. See, but, the, but that's but, Oaken's point is because yes. you don't like that they're rich, but is that actually no, no, no. hurting productivity? Well, is it hurting product? I mean, so the, the idea, right, that, well, so I, so I will answer that, but I wanted to make one earlier. I'm going to go back and then come back. But um, one of the, the points that, um, one of the quotes that I had sort of uh, pulled out from what Oaken had said about folks at the top and the rich um, was, quote, if the uses of fat check, if, if the uses of fat checkbooks in the political process can be tightly regulated, the plutocracy will lose much of its political punch, which he says fairly early on in the book, which I think is important, which gets back to a point that I made in my opening remarks, which is that he was writing in 1975. In 1975, a quarter of people were in unions. That was actually like a thing that you had to study and, and learn about. There was some power there. Um, that was that was the moment when Ralph Nader, Ralph Nader turned 40 in 1975. That was the height of him as a consumer advocate out there creating, working to advocate for many of the consumer regulatory agencies that were pushing back. It was right after Watergate and this notion that they were going to regulate campaign finance in ways that I just, I mean, looking sort of looking up what that was, I was like, wow, that's so that's so outside of my understanding of the political process. That. That he did say that you need to do something for folks at the top, but he was pinning his hopes, at least that was my reading of the book over the past few weeks, on a regulatory infrastructure that, that isn't in place anymore today. And I think that gets it one of the very deep concerns that I have at the, at the top is not um, whether or not it, it's the state tax, that's important, but it's how it's affecting the regulatory process or what political issues are actually put on the table or not that affect all these different ways that allow some people to, to keep their gains um, and some people not to get them, but also have this perversion on democracy. So, I mean, I, I didn't mean to dismiss his point, but his, he's working in this particular no, political said, context. If, if you regulate money, yeah. they won't have power. Right. Seems to me, after reading the New York Times on the Federal Election Commission, we haven't met the first condition. Let me switch before we go to the audience a little bit to other policies. So Greg mentioned the EITC, but what other policies would you recommend uh, that would help us achieve more equality with having a minimal or no impact on efficiency. So how would you change the tax code besides the EITC? What about the Social Security disability uh, thing? How would you change the way we finance college education? Melissa, do you want to start? Sure. I'll start with, um, you know, one thing I've written about the tax code, which I feel strongly about, is this... Uh, secondary earner penalty right. that is implicit because we pool income across, you know, within a family and we have a progressive... We could fix you that. Know, we could, you it's can, hard. You can fix that. You can allow secondary earners, you know, you can allow tax couples the 1 to... Tax 1% to pay for it, right? You can, you can, well, right now the tax code explicitly favors married couples right. where a spouse stays at okay, home. Okay, so give us another okay, so example. That's another, another one, I think DI is a great example. Disability insurance. Disability insurance, and I'll add SSI, which is the Supplemental Security Income Program. Explain. Okay, so DI is, you know, we award people, essentially if they qualify with medical conditions, verifying that they're unable to work, um, they're guaranteed an income stream. Now, the problem is if they get better and start to work, they have now signaled to the government they're able to work, and so they lose their check. And so this is a program that incentivizes people not to recover. Um, good academic research has shown for many it becomes, you know, for low-wage folks in tough labor markets, it becomes an early, dis an early retirement program. There are ways that we could maintain our commitment to support those who are unable to work and yet still improve equity and efficiency. One particular way is the DI checks, the medical criteria, there's no variation. So if you are severely disabled or you have uh, as your limiting condition, you know, back pain, which I don't mean to minimize, but that's different than severely disabled. 
your check is the same. So we can have a partial payment system, which allows some people to, let's say, do part-time work, work for a few hours, and still collect some from the system. Other countries do this, we do not. For the child SSI program, this is a program where families who are below a certain income level and their child meets a medical criteria, they get like $570 a month from the federal government. In previous work, I actually empirically tried to estimate the leaky bucket of this program, and I said, look, actually, for a dollar we transfer to a family, their income goes up by 72 cents. So a 28 cents efficiency loss by the parents limiting their own earnings. And I thought this was a pretty, that's a leak I'm willing to, um, you know, I'm willing to take, and that's not that bad. But I, I have evolved in my thinking on that. The program, really, if you think about it in the long term, it gives the parents incentives not to get their kids the help they need. Because if their kid's condition improves, they lose $570 a month. That's exactly what we don't want to incentivize parents to do, right? So we could change the nature of the program to, again, give more money to families with severely disabled children and also to put in bonuses if there's occupational therapy going on or things to improve the condition. So that's, an, that's another. I have a long list. I think there's a lot of programs. Because we're starting with a complex, messy system, much of which has been designed to satisfy political goals, I think there are a lot of programs um, but DI and SSI are, are at the top of my list. Great. I'm tempted to cede my time to Melissa. <laughs> I figure so many of the things she said. Can I, can I say something broader about the book? Please. Let me take exception with one word in the title, and that's the word the. Yeah. Quality efficiency, the big trade off. I think it's a big trade off. And I think it's only one of the trade offs we face in, um, uh, in facing public policy. And indeed, I think he's, in the book, he's actually a little unfair to Milton Friedman. Because he wants this to be the big trade-off. And if this is the big trade-off, then where does Friedman? He's like, I only cares about efficiency. So let me suggest another big trade-off, and that's liberty versus community. I think Oaken basically assumes communitarian values. If his bucket weren't leaky, if he had a perfect bucket, he'd be moved to perfect equality. And I think Friedman would have said, no, no, if people work hard and they produce a great product and people want to spend lots of money on it, then they should, they should keep their money because they earned it. And I, if you, that's very explicit if you read, say, Robert Nozick, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which, of course, Oaken didn't have the opportunity to read because it came a few years later. But he's very explicit that it's not, it's not the government's job to sort of fix the slicing of the economic pie. If people earn something fair and square, it's theirs. And it's not the government's job to sort of redistribute. I mean, I, certainly if I talk to my students, it, I, I wouldn't say, well, you know, you, you A students, you've got a lot of A's already. Shouldn't I redistribute some of your points in my class to the C student who's got so many C's on his transcript? People say, no, no, I earned that A. And I think what Nozick is saying is, yeah, well, if, you, if, you, you know, if Zuckerberg creates a product that everybody really wants, then he should keep his billions. So the book includes an essay that Oaken wrote a couple years later. It does mention Nozick. Oh, it does. OK. I have I'm not, I'm not read that. I haven't seen yeah, the yeah. Version. OK. Justin, pick a policy, not the estate tax. You've already, <laughs> we've already done that one. So I worry that when we do these things, we emphasize how much we disagree more than how much we agree. And I think despite the fact that to be an appropriate carnival show, we have to show both wear red dresses and disagree. Um, well, you failed on one count. <laughs> um, there's enormous agreement amongst economists. So I think we all would agree there's real cost of inequality. Um, and I think in terms of trying to think about, I think we also all agree there's a bunch of policies that uh, do push the frontier out. And most of those, I think, actually come from taking a long-term view. Um, and it's the, it's the short-termism that I think leads us astray. So if you look at things like Raj Chetty's earlier work on teachers, teacher quality has just unbelievably large long-run effects. If you look at the stuff that came out this morning about neighbourhoods, investments in neighbourhoods or moving people to good neighbourhoods has humongous payoffs. I think another one of the important things that's come up, we've had the behavioural economics revolution, which gives us incredibly cheap interventions. So there's this body of work now showing that the barriers that prevent a lot of working class kids from going into higher education is just about information. No one ever bothered to tell them that they could go to Harvard, or in fact that going to Harvard is cheaper than going to the nearest community college. Um, and then, you know, the flip side is we can also all agree there's a bunch of stuff where you do see these trade-offs, and a lot of it's got to do with dumb politics. And there's a lot of dumb politics with a lot of giveaways to bad guys or that, that are completely unnecessary, and, and uh, we economists could and usually do stand up against them. Heather, pick a policy. 
Well, so I want to pick, can I pick two? Well, let me just start sure, with Sure, Melissa set the precedent. Yeah. yeah. Um, so actually... And if I had let her, she would have done 15. Well, I want to pick up. a seminar later. <laughs> I want to pick up on something that, um, that was in Larry Summers' remarks that, that um, actually touches on something that you've mentioned, which is that he actually said the words paid leave, um, which I thought was very interesting because I've not been following his writings that closely to know whether or not he's been talking about that before, but I was pretty excited to hear that. He seems to be inching a little to yeah, the left. No, yeah, it's, yeah, that's that's great. But I mean, I think that that actually pivots quite nicely off of um, the interventions around disability insurance. I mean, right now, we're one of the only countries in the world that doesn't have a paid parental leave program. We also don't have a paid leave program for people who need to care for aging family members or when uh, someone is seriously ill. We have an unpaid program that only covers about 60% of the, the workforce. And so one thing that we could do that would both increase labor supply but would also probably um, affect some of the policies that you were just talking about was to, impl to was, would be to make family medical leave paid and make it available to everyone. So it wasn't just that um, 60% of people who are currently eligible for the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, and that would be 12 weeks of paid leave. I think that would be really great. And I would love to work with Larry Summers if he wants to work on that with me. That'd be great. Um, but second, I'll send him an email. Yeah, I'll <laughs> second, um, on at the other end, I mean, I think um, you know one of the things that I would wonder, actually, Greg, what you would say or Melissa is, you know, what about something like equalizing the um, tax rate on uh, carried interest, the 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 earnings that hedge fund hedge fund managers make. Um, you know, that seems to me that something that would be, you know, it, it seems eminently logical. And you know maybe that's something that we could all up here at least agree is something we should. Yeah, talk I've, about. I've actually written in favor of carried interest reform. I think it's complicated from taxation of partnerships. It gets complicated, but I think the principle that they should be taxed as ordinary income because it is basically labor compensation for labor. That, that I think is, is the right principle. Okay, so you're ready. Can I? I'll be quick. One thing because we've all focused on tax and transfer, which is what Okin did. I think we would be well served if our regulatory system paid more attention to this trade off. Right now, we have a bunch of agencies imposing a lot of regulations on companies, and it doesn't seem to me that they do so with this equity efficiency trade-off in mind. So I think thinking about occupational licensing, which is something the Hamilton Project's written about, or a small business regulation, I think that could be a place where we could see benefits to both. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of people here. Maybe we can take some questions. Uh, there's a mic. Uh, tell us who you are and wait for the mic. Uh, Doug Elmendorf, do you want to start? Uh, so I'm Doug Elmendorf. I have a question about how the growing income inequality since our Oaken wrote this book should affect our view of the leaky bucket. So Larry, in his remarks, said that, well, inequality is a lot greater than it used to be. Therefore, he concludes, uh, we should be doing more redistribution. And I think the analogy here is one end of the island is getting pouring rain, and one end is in a long drought, so it's more important to move water over. That seems to me right if the bucket is no more or less leaky than it was before. But I think whether this particular bucket of tax and transfer policy is more leaky than it was before depends on why this income inequality has increased. So if you raise taxes on higher income people today because they're yet higher income than they used to be to move the money over, you are potentially, I think, causing a greater loss of output if, I think, their higher, wage, higher earnings co income comes because they have higher marginal product that a 1% reduction in their labor supply or a 2% reduction in their labor supply has a bigger economic cost if, they really are, if their higher wages come because they're more productive. So is it clear that the rise in income, in income inequality, leaving aside the political issues, is it clear that that makes a case for more redistribution with a leaky bucket or not? So Doug, I, th I think you've got it half right. Um, so what matters is whether the rise in income it, it, if we're going to start taking money from guys who are really, really high marginal product, then the bucket's even leakier, right? The other part of this, though, is has all the rise in income gone to folks who are at the point where their sensitivity to incentives is higher, right? And so uh, my guess is a whole bunch of money now is with people who uh, money is how you keep score, um, but the actual marginal utility of the money is not necessarily that high. Um, Whereas, you know, uh, in Oaken State, there were arguably more people in the middle where you would expect labor supply incentives to, to matter more. But I think, you know, it's a horse race between the two things that you suggested. And so, uh, you know, the right an uh, part of the answer is, so if I look at a CEO today, I'm not that worried that if their tax rates rise by 10% that they'll stop working, but I should be extra worried if the extra 
productive CEOs, and some of them are. Gentlemen here in the aisle. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, question directly to, are, uh, yes, pardon me, uh, Hans Roger Weber. Uh, the question is to Greg and to Justin, and that is the role of monetary policy and financial markets in the exacerbation, unfortunately, of those inequalities you have referred to. Uh, one of uh, the uh, unintended uh, consequences of monetary policy, unfortunately, as we are learning, is the shift uh, you know, towards you know, owners of assets. So I suppose the question is, how do you resolve that asymmetry? which arises from the desire on the part of the monetary authorities to provide the demand augmenting policies, while at the same time, uh, a further exacerbation uh, on the fiscal side. Uh, I'm sure that monetary policy, by changing the relative price of various financial assets, has impacts on the inequality of, of income and, and wealth. There's, there's no doubt that's right. On the other hand, I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't think Janet should be spending her time worrying about that, because she's got a lot of stuff on her plate to worry about, like inflation and unemployment. And I think in, in the main inequality picture is really a long run picture. It's a story that's basically been unfolding since the 70s to today, or it's a very long time. And I kind of think over that time frame, the monetary policy impacts are relatively small. And the, the sort of the first order impacts are really the technology and education, sort of oh, the first I, order story. I, so it is a, one, a, a claim one hears, <coughs> excuse me, often, the quantitative easing, because it increased the price of assets, has raised, in a, uh, raised the inequality. And it's a subject we're going to, the Hutchins Center is going to take up in an event in June, but let me just make two responses. First of all, it's a myth that somehow conventional monetary policy has no distribution effects. Obviously, if you're a borrower or a creditor, it makes a big difference what interest rates are. And secondly, it depends what your counterfactual is. If you had decided that the Fed didn't do QE and we had four percentage points more unemployment, it's not clear to me that we would be better off. So I think picking your counterfactual is really important. Uh, a gentleman there in the aisle in the blue, and then uh, one in the back. Uh, hi, my name is Mike Golash. I'm not an economist, so maybe I'm a little simplistic. But it seems that the fact that the top 1% have gotten all this excess capital and money, you have to ask the question, where does it come from? And it seems fundamentally it comes from the fact that minimum wage has not gone up, workers have lost their jobs, unions have been weakened considerably. So it's not like that money just came out of the sky. It came out of not giving workers the gains they deserve from the increased productivity they've realized after, over the last 40 or so years, and it's actually efforts to really drive down their real wages. So that's the reason why I'm concerned about the fact that people at the top have so much and the people at the bottom are falling behind. Right. <clears throat> I think it's a mistake to think of economic growth as zero sum. So the fact that Mark Zuckerberg has a lot of money isn't the cause of people at the bottom not having money. Similarly, think of, think of internationally. Sub-Saharan Africa is very poor. The United States is very rich. Do you think the fact that, that we are rich makes them poor? I, think, I don't think anybody would make that argument, right? Sub-Saharan Africa too, could do better. That doesn't mean we have to do worse. Okay, so I, so I think it's probably a mistake to think of the economic pie as, as fixed in size. I, 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 wanna, I think we're enormously more agnostic about that, um, which is, of course, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg got richer. In an earlier era, Mark Zuckerberg might have been negotiating with unions which would have meant that Mark would have had to share more of it. Um, so I, I think there's strong arguments in both directions, and we know very little as a profession. I think, I think that's right that we know very little, but in, in a, a generation earlier, he could not have created a platform that a billion people took up creating that value. I mean, we had a boxer this weekend who took home $100 million, which strikes me as ludicrous, but like, there was a world of people watching it who paid to watch him. I mean, who, where did that money come from? It's not clear that it was $100 million that would have been split differently in an earlier generation. But you do make an important point, which is that the erosion of these institutions of the bottom have hurt folks at the bottom. So I don't... You know, I don't want to just—I don't want the top one percent to distract us from thinking about what's going on with the wages at the bottom. Even if it's not that their wages are lower because the folks at the top are richer, their wages are lower. Now, I think this gets back to an earlier point, which Greg brought up about education. We know that the returns to higher education are as high as they've ever been. And so we can think about transferring resources, not in the sense necessarily of wage supports or cash, but by putting a lot more money and energy into expanding access to education, to increasing the rate at which people get the right types of education, invest in training, and those types of things. Well, I, I think that, that um, 
when you asked your question, Mike, I think the picture that came into my mind is one that I feel like I've seen, if I've seen once, I've seen a thousand times, which is when you look over the post-war period, you can you see that the um, trajectory of wages and productivity was in alignment from about the end of World War II until about the time Oaken wrote his book. I'm not blaming him. But then after that, <laughs> at any rate, uh, th 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 at some point after Very generous that, of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you start to see these two trends diverge in a really, and, and it's it's remarkable because it's not it's not just one year. It's not this sort of, you know, uh, one-off. This is this long-term, decades-long trend. And I think your question gets right at the heart of that, which is, like, so America has been getting richer and richer and richer. As a nation, we continue to get wealthier. Um, companies in America, the, the way that we measure productivity, they're getting richer. But America's workers, on average, haven't. And so you're right. Somebody's taken the money. Where is it going? That is a question that we should be asking. But I do think we need to deal with that fact that you have seen this divergence between wages and productivity. As economists, I think that's one of our most profoundly fundamental challenges. Thank you, Aaron. In the back. And then Emily, there's one, there's a gentleman right here. Uh, he's raising his hand back, turn around. Just one comment on uh, the uh, sartorial aspects of media training. You might have noted that the men both chose to wear dark jackets. As well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle uh, I wore Was that your trenchant comment of the day? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <with> <laughs> I th I'd like to pick up on uh, Heather's last remark. It's striking the publication date, which really did mark the end of an era of an increase in equality, uh, along with a lot of economic growth in the United States. The first oil shock had just occurred when uh, Art was writing his book. And uh, it's sort of before and after the publication of this book, the trends diverge greatly. Picking up on um, uh, Doug Elmendorf's question, one other thing has changed enormously since then, which may affect the uh, degree to which the bucket leaks, at least for the United States, and that is the very substantial increase in the openness of the U.S. economy, uh, and in particular of capital movements around the world. Uh, this is a real question. I don't know the answer, but I'd be curious as to what uh, the panel thinks about the impact that has on our capacity uh, to rein in inequality, particularly at the top and particularly for capital income. Globalization, Greg, you want to take it away? I, 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 there's two elements of globalization. One is just trade, um, in trade in goods, which probably hasn't been a contributing factor to increased inequality because we tend to import stuff produced with unskilled labor abroad and export stuff produced by skilled labor, and that tends to increase the demand for skilled labor relative to unskilled labor. And then there's the, the international flows of capital, um, which I think is a more complicated, harder one to get your, your, your mind around. I think what it has meant is that sort of Wall Street is leveraging itself around the world, and there's a lot of big incomes in Wall Street. And I think a superstar-like phenomenon we've talked about probably does apply to Wall Street. A few people on Wall Street really figure out how to leverage their skills, not just in their local bank, but really in a worldwide financial community. And so the Sherwin-Rosen story about superstars probably has applied to a few people on, on Wall Street, and globalization probably has <coughs> contributed to that. There's also the issue of um, workers from around the world, and this is where I get worried. We can't just think that, gosh, let's raise the minimum wage and let's get back to really high rates of unionization and not think that employers in the U.S. will either, you know, move those jobs or import those goods from abroad or shift to technology. So it's, it's both the global labor market and the rapid pace of technological development that I, I think makes it very challenging to figure out how to bolster wages in a way that doesn't have disincentives for employment in the U.S. Well, can I ask one, one really important fact that we have not said yet? Is while inequality has been going up in the United States, inequality has been going down around the world. If you take, if you're a global citizen, you know, we're in the United States, we're about the whole world, we were a much more equal world than we were 30 years ago. And that's largely because of tremendously rapid growth in China and India, which has brought many, many pe people out of very, very deep poverty. So if you really take a global perspective, we're, we're, there's good news about inequality. But I think the typical American voter may not take much solace in that fact that China and India are doing just fine. But if you take a somewhat more global view, it's not 
the picture is not nearly as dire as, as we make it sound. But the benefits to trade here in the U.S. have not accrued to. I mean, the, when you look at the effect on workers' wages, um, and you know, the pa one of my one one of the papers I think is you know most interesting and in, that's new in this area is of course um, David Otter's work with um, with Dorn and a bunch of other authors looking at the the effect of the increase in Chinese imports after the opening up of um, trade with China in 2000 and what that did to communities around the country and that it lowered um, wages for U.S. workers. So. I mean, I think thinking about the trade issue and who is bearing the cost of this is a is an important question for inequality. But I think it also comes back to this question about, you know, as we've seen the gains of productivity not going to U.S. workers, you know, where are they going? Are they? I mean, maybe they're all going to to um, higher paid workers in China that U.S. firms are paying, and that's why we've seen this gap in in um, wages and productivity in the U.S. I, my gut is that that's probably not true. I've not seen the paper to prove that, but I do think, um, you know, there do seem to be some serious consequences. That we should be talking Pastor, about. But Heather, I think what you're missing here is what we care about is real wages. Real wages is how much stuff you can buy. So that's partly your wage and it's partly the price of stuff. And it turns out trade drives down the price of stuff and poor people buy stuff, rich people buy services which are not traded and those prices aren't, aren't going down as much. China is one of the greatest gifts to the American working class that we've had. Uh, gentleman there in the back. <coughs> uh, my name is Casey Dinges, an uh, old family friend of the Okins, um, but I've lived in town for 35 years. Um, my question is fairly simple. Um, That's right. Long time friend of the Okins, but I've lived in town? Is and so? I have. <laughs> <laughs> me. I was trying to defend Thank Washington a little bit. <laughs> no, I've, I've loved living here. Um, the question is, um, as we watch Congress kind of dance with letting the Highway Trust Fund go bankrupt at the end of the month, um, would not an infrastructure investment policy allow the nation to move forward on both issues? So, on behalf of Larry Summers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anybody want to disagree? If only we could get both sides to agree to it. Yeah. No, but I have to advertise now. Next Monday, <coughs> join us here. Hamilton Project will be sitting up here talking about um, investments in infrastructure and ways to move forward. I do think there's broad <coughs> consensus on your point how to do that in uh, an efficient way raises more challenges. Uh, Greg, Greg, you want to stand so the mic can find you? Thanks, Greg Ip of the Wall Street Journal. We know in retrospect that when Oaken was writing, this was a period at which the economy had exceeded potential. Unemployment had fallen below its natural rate. We had a really serious inflation problem. It's been a long time since we've had that set of problems. And if you look back at the last 30 years, the only time when we really made um, progress reversing inequality was during the late 1990s, which was a high pressure economy with very low unemployment. Long way of saying, if we could get that economy back with a sustained period of very low unemployment, perhaps below its natural rate, maybe all the institutional factors you've been discussing here will turn out to be very second or third order in terms of turning this around. Perhaps long way of saying, maybe it is all up to Janet Yellen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she appreciates that, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, the high-pressure economy concept, the notion that when the economy is running with very little unemployment and workers have more, uh, when employers have less choice, was one that Oaken wrote about. And I, he may even have coined the term. I don't know. So anybody, how much of this is cyclical? How much better off would we be on the inequality front if we had I don't know. The financial potential. crisis was actually pretty good for inequality because those people with, you know, if, if, that's it. Um, Alan Greenspan sort of made this point a long, long time ago during the 70s. During this, actually, he was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, and he was testifying in front of Congress, and, and some member said, isn't this, this was their 70s, mid-70s recession, and some congressman said, you know, Chairman Greenspan, isn't this, partic isn't this recession particularly hard on the poor? And Greenspan said, st well, statistically speaking, Congressman, actually it's the stockbrokers that are suffering the worst. Which, of course, was not a very political answer, but we saw the same thing in the, in the recent financial crisis. You know, in, in a, if you're a hedge fund manager and, it's, and pr prices are falling, it's very, very bad for your incomes. So if you actually, actually look at the inequality measures, they, they became more equal during the financial crisis. Now, that's not a good thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm not sure the cycle... I was worried there for a while. No, 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 no. I wasn't going that way. But I, I think the, the, the story between cycle, what's going on in the business cycle and inequality is, I think, a little, is, is a little more, is a little more but complicated. But isn't there a possibility if we had... More closer to full employment, we'd see more wage increases at the bottom 80 percent. So, so we, actually, we actually have good evidence on this. There was a Brookings paper a couple of years ago by Annette Vizing Jorgensen and Jonathan Parker. So, a high pressure economy tends to lift the bottom end of the distribution exactly the way we thought it would. Interestingly, the thing we hadn't seen before, but Greg had seen, is it actually also lifts the very top, the top, very top end of town. So, um, Janet's in the process of helping the working and middle classes and the super rich. 
<laughs> if she, if she. Um, let, I, uh, I want to close by reading <coughs> something that just struck me. This is a, the last paragraph of the essay that Oaken wrote two years later, and uh, as you'll see, you'll see why I read it. He says, at the moment, he's writing this uh, 38 years ago, at the moment we are experiencing a disturbing divisiveness. Recent efforts to curb the market's transgression on equal political rights have frightened those who hold the bulk of the wealth and think that they therefore hold the bulk of the truth. There is a more obvious growth of anti-capitalist sentiments by the non-affluent. Profits and rich are often dirty words in the halls of Congress. The rationing and allocative functions of the price system are blithely ignored by many of our legislators. Instead of blending the values of capitalism and democracy, many are pitting them against each other. Instead of compromising, we are polarizing. The nation sorely needs a serious dialogue and a major under educational undertaking to develop the enlightened attitudes of compromise. I can't think of a better way to end this than to read that old passage. And join me in thanking our panelists for helping us develop the enlightened attitudes of compromise.